Books make you hope. Books make you dream. Books make you laugh. Books make you scream. This is the Books That Make You Show. Discussing books with authors and experts, unraveling the inner pages of all the books that help make us who we are. Hosted by Desiree Duffy. Hello. Welcome, everybody. My name is Desiree Duffy, and this is the Books That Make You Show. And today, we're talking about books that make you get whisked away on a sweeping historical, epic adventure. Books based on historical events that also intertwine the lives of different people. They can be some of the most immersive, right? Especially when they're researched meticulously, historically accurate. They can give us insights into different times and parts of the world and people. I mean, when fiction and history come together like that, It's magical within the pages of a book. Today, our guest is David L. Robbins. Since 1997, he's published 15 novels, and he's made many repeated visits to the New York Times bestsellers list. He has had several of his works optioned for film as well. He's had five different stage plays professionally produced, and he has taught advanced creative writing at the university level for 15 years. And he is the kind of guy that helps other writers out too. His latest book is called Isaac's Beacon. Now in it, the lives of three characters, an Ingrid fighter, a young woman farmer, and an American journalist, well, they all collide and shape this epic narrative with love and loss. There's violence, there's courage. This book has it all. David L. Robbins has been called the Homer of World War II. And he turns his mastery of the historical novel into another defining moment of the 20th century with this book. Hi, David. Welcome to the show. I just wish I was that guy, Desiree. Wow. That, <laughs> man, I, I could stop now after that intro. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. You bet. Well, you are that guy. I love having authors on the show that are prolific. I mean, wow. 15 novels and everything that you do to help other writers out and teaching and the film and uh, having your plays turned into productions. All of that is amazing. So let's start, though. We're going to get into that. But I want to set the stage for Isaac speaking because this is your latest novel. So can you can you tell us, orient us, orientate us, I should say. Where are we? Space, time, what's going on? I, um, like a great many uh, years ago, read Leon Uris's Exodus, and you know, for a lot of people, it was it was it was kind of one of our first introductions to historical fiction. You have Michener and Uris and and the works of James Clavell, you know, the Shogun books. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, if you read like I did, you moved from those into the big scale um, worlds of Isaac Asimov and. And um, so then, then Frank Herbert's Dune in the science fiction world. And those are kind of in their own way historical novels, although they're, they're fantasy, right? But they have that scope and that sweep and that scale. And, and they're, they're equal parts about the world and the characters, right? And um, I had always, those are the books I read when I was a kid. I read, I, I, I read biographies and I read these big sweeping uh, historical novels. And, and I, I found those worlds were the best beds for me to lay my imagination on. I could just I could just rest in those worlds. They were immense. So I have for years set myself the goal of finding these big, big epochs. So I've written about the Battle of Stalingrad, the fall of Berlin, uh, the fall of Paris. Um, uh, you know, and, I, and I've gone back and forth racking the focus wide and narrow, wide and narrow. But in the background for years and years has always been this book, this book about Israel. Um, I I, I think that if we were to take the 10 most foundational events of the 20th century, and we were all to do our own list, I think on everyone's list would be things like, okay, the World War II, the creation of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, things like that, at least here in the Western world. And one of them, I think, would be on everybody's list is the creation of the state of Israel. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to take a political side left or right. I'm not, I'm not, the book is not about um, pro or anti. It's a setting, as you said, for characters. Um, mm-hmm. 
It's it, and it's a huge setting, but the creation of the state of Israel has driven no small amount of world politics during the, the whole second half of the 20th century, and and certainly up until today. You know, and and so I, this was always something that I had set aside and didn't feel I was a good enough writer to tackle because it's so. I mean, let's face it, you weren't about you write about World War II, you got bad guys. You got bad guys. And 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 but the the issues that I tried to tackle in Isaac's Beacon, they're not so morally uh analog. It's there really aren't bad guys because everybody plays that role. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's arguable that the um I don't think it's arguable in my mind that the Jewish people, like all people, deserve a homeland. But that also includes the Palestinian people. They deserve a homeland. So I've got really competing interests between two peoples who make really good claims, you know, um, that go back thousands of years. This isn't like a courtroom dispute about a title from 1960. This is from the year from 60, you know, and and. Um, so I, I didn't really think I was a good enough, experienced enough researcher and writer um, to take on this book um, until until I did. Uh, and I'm um, so I'll, I'll set it for you. The book starts um, the book starts at the end of World War II, starts in May of 1945, um, when uh, May 9th to be exact, when uh, when the war ended and Germany fell, and it opens up at Buchenwald. Uh, and we meet um, uh, a Holocaust survivor named Hugo, and then so um, we follow Hugo. Well, let me let me let me digress. The structure in my head for the book is that I feel like there's three miracles that can be um, that can be attended to the, the creation of the state of Israel. One is the military uh, miracle, the the winning of this place, right? The second is the agricultural miracle. And the third is the diplomatic miracle, right? Um, so I have three characters that represent those three, those three quadrants. So Hugo represents the militaristic miracle. Mm -hmm. And I, maybe miracle is the wrong word because it seems to have a positive spin. And I'm not trying, again, I'm not trying to do anything polemical. Right. I, I have a different agenda, which I'll explain in a moment. But but Hugo handles the militaristic side. We meet Hugo. He's barely survived the Holocaust, and he ends up going to Palestine because at the time of the book, there's no Israel. It's Palestine. Mm -hmm. He goes to Palestine. He ends up joining the Irgun, um, which was a dissident group that had as its uh, as its first big chore to get the British out of out of Palestine. The second is um, the agricultural miracle, the changing of this this basalt limestone land into, you know, a very productive oasis of greenery, orange groves and olive uh, um, groves and, and, and immense farms and, and citrus. And, and so it's, it's a, it's a fertile place, but it wasn't um, mm -hmm. for, for hundreds of years, thousand years. And so uh, my second character is Rivka. Rivka is on a small kibbutz uh, and the book gets its name, Isaac's Beacon. It gets its name from this kibbutz, um, which is named Meswat Yitzchak. It's about 20 kilometers south of Jerusalem. And a lot of the action takes place in this kibbutz, as I'll explain later. Um, so we see the agricultural side uh, of the creation of the state through Rivka's experiences on the kibbutz. And the diplomatic side, the news, right, um, there's a character named Vince Haas. And Vince is based on a real reporter named I.F. Stone, who um, rode an illegal ship to Palestine, stayed in Palestine, covered Palestine uh, for the Times Herald Tribune in New York. And so uh, Vince's, a lot of the adventures Vince has are rooted in the reality of what I have stoned in. So these three characters handle the diplomatic, the militaristic, and the agricultural creation of the state. And then we follow, um, maybe it needs a little more context. In 1945, there was no Israel. There was no Palestinian state. There was right. a territory mandated by uh, mandated by the League of Nations, and given over to the, uh, Great Britain to 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 administer this this part of the world. And so um, there was no country of Israel, and there was no country of Palestine. There was uh, a territory that was administered on behalf of the of the UN by Britain, and the Jews wanted 
their own homeland. And the Palestinian Arabs, who were indigenous there, of course, wanted to maintain their own homes. Um, so the war ended. Uh, the British refused to leave. They said, you know, the Jews were like, well, look, we had a really rough time, clearly, and we'd like this as our homeland now. And the British, having just come out of World War II, said, now nah, we're not going anywhere because they, they're retracting in India, they're retracting in Egypt, they're retracting in Jordan. So the British were losing their foothold in this part of the world, and they were going to keep their foothold in Palestine. Um, they needed a point of contact with the Arab world because of the emergence of petroleum, et cetera. Um, and so the British fought very hard to keep Jews out of Palestine. Now, here's a trivia question, Desiree. Um, between 1945, the end of World War II, and um, May 1948, three years exactly, like May 9th, the war ends, 45, May 14th, the state of Israel is created. In those three years, how many Jews made it from Europe, from the camps in Europe and the displaced persons uh, camps in Europe? How many made it to Palestine? Oh, um, geez, I don't know. And since you're asking that, I'm kind of suspecting this might be a, a little bit of a trick question. Not fair, not fair. <laughs> what's, your, what's your gut instinct? I would say 10,000. Actually, brilliant, 11,000. Oh, wow, okay. Most people would say millions. Mm hmm and, and they don't understand that the British stopped that immigration. The British would not allow Jews to go from the camps to Britain. They had very, very low quotas. And so um, the, the Yeshuv had a government, um, and that Yeshuv, the Yeshuv, the Yeshuv means the people of, of the Jews of Israel. They had a government, and, that, and the head of that government was David Ben-Gurion. But there was a shadow military. The Haganah was the military of the Yeshuv. But there was a shadow military, and that was the Irgun. And also another group called the Lehi, which we know as the Stern Gang, and they were dissidents, and they were um, they were they they did not eschew violence. So the book covers, in large part, the revolt from 1945 until the British left in 48 between the Irgun and the Lehi against the British occupation. Um, to quote Winston Churchill, he said, "There are 100,000." military age males in Palestine. I have 100,000 soldiers in Palestine and still the Jews will not be pacified. <clears throat> so a lot of the book details the, the, the warring back and forth that's covered by Vince, that's experienced by Rivka, that's largely fomented by Hugo. Um, and so then the book, so the book ends on May 14th, 1948, the day that Ben-Gurion announces the creation of the state of Israel. And that night, five the, Air, the tanks of five Arab nations invade Israel across the frontier. So the book ends at the, at the creation of the state, and within hours it will be invaded by five nations, which was the 1948 Israeli-Arab war. Okay, okay. Here's a context. There's a lot going on there. Okay. And I like how you frame this around these three characters. So t talk a little bit about developing these characters as it pertains to being historically accurate, because they're not real characters, right? But right. you make them plausible. H how, how does that work? How do you do that research? How do you be authentic in, in that way? Well, that's a that's a brilliant question. And I think that is one of the one of the foundational pillars of any any historical writer, any historical fiction writer, is we we live between those two worlds, right? Because you need a fictional narrative that's thrilling and compelling, and you want people to turn the pages. And sometimes history plays ball. A lot of times history plays ball. But sometimes history doesn't. And then you have to sort of fill in those gaps. But then you feel guilty when you fill in those gaps. You're like, well, that didn't happen. So you, you there's always this push-me-pull you between the, the, the narrative and the facts when you're writing historical fiction. I've been really lucky um, in that this particular story, I never had a moment where I felt like I was pulling the story, like, come on, let's, you know, like, like I'm a sled dog hauling it. I was chasing the story the whole time. Mm -hmm. There was so much. Um, so one of the things I want to talk to you, for those folks out there listening to this, um, who are themselves historical writers, always try to write the story you feel you have to chase. If you mm -hmm. have to pull it, something's wrong. If you go, ah, when they talk about the mushy middle, 
Any book that has a mushy middle is a story you should not be writing. You should, from day one to the day you put save and you're done, you should feel like you're chasing that story. Um, and this this book was very much that. Um, so let's talk about Hugo first, my ear um, the, the The battles between the Irgun, the underground, which is run by um, Menachem Begin, by the way, who later became prime minister of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, the, the battles between the Irgun and the British are well documented. So one of the things I'm proudest of is when you read this book, across the spectrum of those three quadrants, we can't have three quadrants, so so three sections, um, the agricultural, the, 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 the military, and the diplomatic, I think that when you put this book down, you'll be well-versed in all of them. And there are catchwords. There's there's the destruction of the King David Hotel, which the Irgun did. There's the um, uh, blowing up of Goldschmidt House. There's the mining of Citrus House. There's the the, um, the hanging of two sergeants in a, in a in a eucalyptus grove in Natanya. There's the whipping of 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 a of a British corporal in public because the British had whipped an Irgunist. There's the hanging of Dove Gruner. There's the the the, the suicide. Um, by a grenade that got smuggled into a prison in an orange of Berezani and Feinstein to Irgunists. So this is, I mean, I'm talking about two Irgunists who were going to assassinate the warden and the guards on the gallows in the prison in Jerusalem. Yet the rabbi came to them and said, I will be on the gallows with you. The last face you see will be a Jew. And they could not talk the rabbi out of attending their execution. So instead of doing it on the gallows, they they had an, a, a grenade smuggled in in an orange, and the smuggler in the book is Hugo. Mm, okay. And they and they there was a guard, and in and in, in and in Jewish lore, in Israeli lore, there's a he's called the kind guard, and he was kind to Berezani and Feinstein, and they asked him to step back, and he did, and they hugged each other and pulled a pin on this grenade that was inside an orange and blew themselves apart. Wow. And and so and so I have that happen while Vince so while Vince is visiting them I tell that through the eyes of Vince like yeah. cuz he's a reporter's interviewing them. And so but I mean I'm down I'm the level that I try to recreate in the book is down to the fact that I even have them to say to the guard, "Hey, you're a good guy, could you step back?" cuz that happened in real life. And I um so I so that's Hugo. He his um, in, his involvement with the the Irgun is, I think, spot on. Right. Then there's Rivka, um, who ends up on this kibbutz Meswat Yitzchak, and um, I had to learn a whole lot about things like desalination and you know prepping soil and growing an olive grove. Um, but her story, uh, Rivka's story, is she lost everyone in the Holocaust, so she's alone. Um, and she's befriended by a woman named Mrs. Papel. And so um, Rivka's, Rivka is the heart of the story. She's the romantic heart. She's, um, you just, I love writing her chapters because she she doesn't believe in violence. When she and Hugo meet, they don't get along. Because mm -hmm. Hugo believes that Israel should be taken, right? And that's not a Zionist notion, by the way. The Zionists, to a large extent, believe God gave them Israel it was theirs by, theirs by right, but a great many believed, like Hugo and Rivka did, they were on separate sides, is the, the Irgunists and the militarists said, well, look, we'll just take it. I mean, if, if the Arabs won a war, we'll give them a war, and we'll win that war, and by winning that war, we'll win ourselves a nation. Um, so Hugo represents that. Rivka represents the exact opposite. She says, no, this is a fertile land. We we should win we should win Israel by the seed, by the seed. Mm -hmm. by the, we should plant, and and part of what she wants to plant is is um, empathy with the Arab neighbors and and children. So in the end, by the end, the book is end. Uh, Rivka is pregnant, and I'll just spoiler alert: she's pregnant uh, with Vince's kid. Okay. So because Vince and Hugo and 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 Rivka become like this trio in this in this kibbutz, which they end up defending. Um, but Rivka and Hugo are very opposite viewpoints of, of, of even contemporary Jewish thought about Israel. Is yeah. There is enough to share, or now nah, we want it fair and square in a war that we didn't start. And then yeah. Vince is right down the middle. He's a reporter. And then Vince is always agnostic. 
He sees um, a great deal of the privation that the Arabs endure. And I think it's important in, in all my books, to be fair, I don't, I don't ever want anybody to say I'm taking a side in my work. My work is not my place for, for politics. Um, so Vince is my reporter. He's my character that hovers above uh, uh, the whole world and the characters okay. and reports. And throughout the book, um, maybe five, six times, I use a chapter. Um, at, I use Vince's column that he writes for the Times Herald as the chapter. Okay. Okay. It's a cool device. So those three. Yeah. Um, but in terms of accuracy, um, boy, if I'm proud of anything about this book, I think that readers will hopefully email me my website and go, "Okay, um, amazing that we look, we Googled you and you got all that right." <laughs> fingers, but, fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it is. That's one of the tricks of historical fiction, because yeah, if they find something, those readers tend to, to be sticklers about it. Um, I just yeah, I want to underscore really quick. I like the fact that you have these three characters and you, you've got the heart, for example, and then you got kind of like that every man. And you mentioned your other books, too. So and I know that can be considered something that writers do. They they have the different characters take on the role of the heart or the humorous rogue. You have the hero. So talk a little bit as a writer and maybe giving some writerly advice to others. Um, and, you know, is this something that you, you do a lot? How do you kind of devise who the characters are going to be and what they represent? I, Desiree, let me let me admire the question. Uh, that's, that's a wonderful question. I love questions that elicit um, real pedagogical advice for writers. Um, I get to talk about my own work, but I also get to reach out and, and, and help hopefully the writers in the audience. Um, but I have a theory um, and, I, and, I, and I express this theory in my own work. I believe every character should be like a chess piece. Mm -hmm. Now think about a chessboard, right? It's made up of pieces that are identifiable by their configuration, but also mostly how they move, yeah? So, you know, a, a rook does this and a, a bishop does that and a pawn does this and the queen can do what she likes. Um, the king can go anywhere, one space. Pawns are like pawns, they're done. Knights can a little more flexible, but but there's there's inflexibility and limitations on each piece. They are identifiable. A rook is not a bishop, clearly, plainly. Yet, when they engage in the game of chess, the complexities are unlimited, unlimited. So look at the amount of complexity you can create out of simplicity, right? And I try to take a very chessboard view to my writing. Is So Hugo is my angry, violent, yet sympathetic and sad character because everybody's dead, right? He's alone in the world and he's just trying to find a place where he feels safe. And in one of the lines I admire, sorry, but I admire <laughs> in the book myself is Vince asks him, why don't you go to America? Why are you going to Palestine? And Hugo says, my own particular brand of terror demands that I be safe by my own hand. Mm -hmm. And that would be Palestine. In America, you'd have to rely on other people. In Palestine, he can be, make himself safe. After what he's gone through, right? So that's my, so Hugo is very identifiable. Rivka, very identifiable. She's, she's loving, she's forgiving, she's brave, she's um, physically intrepid. Um, and she, in the, even in the face of danger, holds her ground that there's room for all in Palestine. And Hugo's like, nope, room for Jews, right? And then I've got Vince. So you can see this theme taking shape about how these are identifiable, yet simple characters. Yet you turn them loose, and they create this really complex world. And Vince is kind of my queen on the page. He can go anywhere he wants because he's a reporter. Mm -hmm. he, he's really the more powerful of the characters because he's less rooted. But Vince represents, to me, um, he's my he's my arms budsman for the reader. Right. Vince is the guy who says, hey, reader, this is what I saw. This is what's going on. I was in this conversation between Rivka and Hugo and they went nuts. Um, and so the things like that are through Vince's view. And then towards the end of the book, I co-opt Vince. Um, uh, but I won't tell you how, you know, but I end up co-opting him. Um, OK. Uh, one side or the other. He gets caught up. But the, the book um, wants to have epic scope. It wants it wants to be very um, very big and broad, um, and that can best be done with simple tools. I think. So I say to writers, um, 
don't design multifaceted complex characters that have 16 pages of backstory. Design a character who's greedy and a character who's a coward and a character right. who's, who's brave and principled and a character who's a father and will do anything for his, for his daughter. Design that and then work outwards from that. Think of your characters as chess pieces because the best thing any reader can say about a, a, a character is that they saw themselves in that character. Mm-hmm. And, and the more complex we make a character, the less we can identify with them. But if I have a brave character, or more likely for me, a coward, <laughs> I can go, yeah, I, I see that. And if I see a loving character or a, or a forgiving character, I can go, oh, I aspire to be that. But if I see a character that's just way complex and got all kinds of motivations, I'm like, I, I'm not, I don't know who that guy is. Yeah, yeah. So simplicity is a great tool. And the bigger the scope, I think the more identifiable characters should be. I love the chess analogy. That makes perfect sense. It puts it into so, it's so contextual. I appreciate that. And I appreciate everything that you do for other writers too. I mean, we scratched the surface a little bit, but you have the James River Writers group. It's a nonprofit that you founded, correct? As well as you co-founded the Podium Foundation, as well as the Mighty Pen, which was for veterans. Do you want to really quickly just let people know about some of your, uh, some of the ways that you help other writers with these sure. organizations? And and I'm this may come as a brag, but I don't want to do them a disservice. It's actually a fourth. Um, mm. It's called Frontline Writers, and um, it's for first responders. Oh, nice, nice. So, most of 20 years ago, um, myself and some uh, local writers here in Richmond, some good people, um, good writers, we started a thing called the James River Writers. And it, 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 it's still in business. They do a great job. It's become kind of one of the go-to writers conferences on the East Coast. So if you're in, on the East Coast, look up James River Writers. Um, the conference is always in October. Um, so out of that... Um, I, I got to, I was writer in residence at my my alma mater, William & Mary, for a couple of years. And that was a cool platform. So while I was writer in residence, um, the city of Richmond, uh, the prosecuting office, prosecutors asked me to take a look at our, our city's writing programs in our city schools. And it was less than impressive. I mean, this is like 12 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we didn't really do, I thought, a good enough job um, um, really tending to the creativity of our, of our, of our youth here in the city. And I love my city. I'm a native here and I will die here. Um, um, but this seemed to be a bit of a chasm. So um, I reported that back. And so I got my best friend, Lindy Bumgarner, who's still my best friend. And we started a thing called the podium foundation. And I being an uh, old, old hippie, um, wanted to create it as a safe space for young people to get together and in their schools and in these clubs, uh, uh, a podium clubs and, and just have a safe space to communicate and be valued and, and have and, and to do that for others. But then because Lindy's a genius, uh, it's grown um, way, way, way past my humble beginnings. Um, so uh, podium uh, and we have the podium foundation. I think our website is podium RVA. Um, and then, okay. so six years ago, Coming up on seven, um, I got the crazy idea that veterans deserved more than the occasional weekend of writing training. I was mm-hmm. reading something in the paper about a weekend writing retreat for veterans. I'm like, okay, first of all, that's disrespectful to both entities. It's disrespectful to veterans that they get a weekend, and it's disrespectful to the craft of writing that you can teach anybody anything a weekend, right? Yeah. But it seemed to be a little lip servicey. So I live a mile from uh, the rich, uh, the Virginia War Memorial, which is a stunning facility. Um, and because I'd written a lot of military fiction, I, I knew some folks over there. And I recommended that we start a writing program that mirrored the university classes I teach uh, here at Virginia Commonwealth University, VCU. So we do a 12-week um, semester. Veterans don't pay for it. Um, I like to say they already paid for it. It just took me a while to get it to them. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so we, it, it's, there's, we run three classes a year. Um, we always fill up and, and by the way, if I could plug, if you're interested in reading some of the stories written by these veterans, we have an archive that has 119 edited stories on it that we've collected over the last six years. And if you just look up mighty pen project VCU, it will take you to this stunning archive that's being read 200 times a month. Oh, uh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that's, a, that's incredible. Yeah. These stories, these stories are traveling around the world. 
And yeah. then a year and a half ago, I was approached by um, the police here in the city. Um, this, they admired the Mighty Pen Project and they wanted their own writing program. So we started a thing called Frontline Writers, um, which is doing the same thing that the Mighty Pen does for police, fire, and emergency medical. So there's, there's four. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love everything you do. David L. Robbins. Oh my gosh. I could talk to you all day, but really quick, because we're running up against the clock. There you go. Hold that up. And I just want to say that you're going to be at the book fast coming up in October on the 23rd and 24th, doing something called Critiki Bar with Catherine Sands, where you're going to critique the first page of a manuscript. Why really quick? Why is that first page just so important for, for writers to get right? Well, a lot of reasons. And, and, and first of all, let me, let me real quickly talk about the raison d'etre of why um, I'm, Catherine and I are linking up. Catherine and I are old friends. Um, she's a very well, well, very well known agent. Uh, she's she runs some, uh, the Sarah Jane Fryman Agency, and we've all gone to a lot of writers' conferences. You run one, I ran one, um, and you hear a lot of writers talk, a lot of agents talk, a lot of editors talk. But if you put them all side by side, you get very different bits of advice. I have no advice whatsoever for an author on the business. I, I don't. I know what little I know to keep my lights on, right? Catherine knows everything. But Catherine is more concerned about what will sell, what she can market, what how she can package. And I could care less. I'm all about the craft and the word on the page, right? Mm-hmm. So what Catherine and I do, we came up with a thing called the Critiki Bar, a writer and an agent going to a bar. And, and, um, and we basically argue. It's kind of click and clack because we're dear friends, but we do take different approaches. So Catherine will read your first page and she will say, oh, um, this didn't grab me. And I'll turn to her and I'll say, what in the hell does that mean? What is a writer supposed to do with that feedback? It didn't grab me. Mm-hmm. So I will, I'll get in there and talk about nuts and bolts. I go, well, maybe if you did this, maybe if you move that, maybe if you emphasize this to emphasize that. So Catherine will talk more about um, genre and 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 setting, and I'll talk about nothing but craft. The first page, and this is a horror story, Desiree. I have sat in agents' offices and watched them read the first page of a book, and if it's in hard copy, throw it away, and if it's online, erase it. They won't read past the first page unless there's something there for them, and there is a list. Of things and a partial list would be you need a strong POV, you need a strong integrated setting. And by integrated, I mean a setting that really brings out the character. If you open up your book with a telephone call or a ride in a car or walk through a park, how is that going to reveal the tensions of the characters, right? Yeah. How's, yeah. That, how's that going to presage the dangers and the perils and the insights coming? So there, there's a list of, uh, of very articulable and predictable and manipulable um, items that should be in the first page so that Catherine and her ilk can look at it and they don't even know why. They don't know why. It's just something magical about that first page because if you get them to read the second page, you're, you're, you're doing much better. Yeah, yeah. First page. But the difference between me and Catherine and why I think people should tune in is because we will give you very different advice. She'll speak more from the gut. Like, ma, and I'll go, well, do this or don't do that. Or you yeah. do it. Right. I like how you and Catherine and what you're doing there mirrors in a lot of ways what you do in your writing where you have these different points of view, but it's about the same thing. And yeah. that's the way life is, right? We all yeah. see the world and see things differently. And I think what you and Catherine do for writers is people process information differently. You know, there's some people that are more emotional. There are some people that are more visual. It's it's just the way we are. So I like how you two come at the same thing from those different points of view to help writers out. And thank you for being at the book fest. If people want to find out more about that and even submit their first page for David and Catherine to, to critique it at critique bar, just go to the bookfest.com. Um, David, we're going to have to have you back because I wanted to talk to you about all of your other books. You've only done what, like 15 books? <laughs> so there's a lot we can talk about. We'll have to have you come back again, okay, my friend? Oh, Desiree, I think you you uh, 
you run a great ship here. You're, I, I so enjoy your company and, and uh, just the energy you bring and the care. Look, I, I dig people who dig writers, you know, um, and, and, and folks, I can tell you uh, my dealings with Desiree is, is it's, um, it's only partly business. She, she loves the, the business, the, the creativity. She loves writers. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to work with you, Desiree. I mean that. So thank you. Your, my pleasure too. That's what we're here for. Uh, David, really quick, can you let everybody know your website again and where they can find Isaac's Beacon and find out more about you and everything you do? Well, let's start with the important one, where to find Isaac's Beacon. You don't need to find me. <laughs> find the book. Um, obviously, it's at Amazon. And obviously, hopefully, it will be in bookstores and near wherever you are. Um, so um, it comes out August 10. Um and um, so, yeah, Amazon's a great place to buy it. Support independent bookstores, obviously. Um, my website is just davidlrobbinsauthor.com or it's authordavidlrobbins.com. But if you Google David L. Robbins, it will take You'll you. find it. You'll find it. Okay. And I, I make you this promise. Any email I get, I will answer. I, I have, in the 20 years I've been in this business, I've never not answered an email. So oh. If you write me, I will write you back. That's wonderful. That is such a great service that you do for aspiring writers. And we'll see you at the Book Fest, October 23rd and 24th. David L. Robbins, thank you for being here today. It's my pleasure, Nana. Thank you, Desiree. You bet. You bet. Hold up that book cover as we say goodbye to everybody. Thank you for being here on the Books That Make You show. You can find out more about us on our website, bookstatmakeyou.com. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. Don't forget to ring the bell so that you're always subscribed to new Books That Make You shows. Until next time, all of my bookish buddies, please enjoy all of the books that make you exactly who you are. The executive producer for Books That Make You is Desiree Duffy, produced and sound mastered by Phil Jean Grande, engineering by Dave Napox, social media and promotion by Bree Sweeter. For more, visit booksthatmakeyou.com.